And he is, isn't he? Well, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Great. Isn't this a beautiful Sunday? Thank the Lord for this beautiful day that he's given us. It's the day the Lord hath made, and we're going to be glad in it. So glad you're here today, too. And we're delighted that during the summer here, we have a number of people who are gone, but then we get a number of visitors. I'm looking out here and I'm seeing lots of visitors today, and we welcome all of you to our Sunday morning service. Just a couple of things that we want to take care of before we begin our worship. Number one is uh, we are going to be voting on the name for the new church at the beginning of Connection Point. So when the service is over, I'm going to be letting everybody go, and I'm going to be asking all members, because while we allow everyone to submit names, it has to be the membership that does the final vote. So I'm asking all members to assemble 15 minutes afterward back in here. We're going to have a few minutes to go over a few things, and then we're going to cast our ballots. And so we are going to be determining the name for our new location today. And we're going to do everything decently and in order. And how blessed it is for brothers and sisters to dwell together in unity. It's, it's all going to be okay. Everybody all right? So I don't want anybody stewing during the service except me. Okay? No one else stew over this during the service. Uh, we're here to worship the Lord today. And uh, Jesus may come before we ever take the vote. So let's, let's focus on what we're here to do today, and that is primarily to worship. But we are going to be taking that vote, so there will be a roll call, and there will be the voting of the membership. And then after that, uh, Charlotte, you're speaking today. Would you stand and tell us what the sh- subject is you're speaking on today? Well, we're going to do something different. Okay. So um, speaking is not the correct word. Um, as when they asked me, immediately I went to the thought, we don't have very many praise and testimony services. And so, and I forgot that this was um, back to the hymn book. But we're doing, uh, seeing from the hymn book, hymns and um, testimonies. And if anybody doesn't have a testimony, can start thinking about it now, <laughs> right? Um, but I do have some fill-ins just in case. So from this from the hymn book, praise God has done so much for our church. Good. Just so many, many miracles. And so these are hymns that I've chosen that are all praise and worship for what God has done. Very good. So there'll be a potpourri of things happening in Connection Point, so you don't want to miss it. And also, members, please stay, because in the event we would have a tie, we will have to have another vote. So keep that in mind. One more quick update. We had hoped that we were going to close on the church this week. We hit a big speed bump. But no, I want you to know it was only a speed bump, meaning it slowed us down. We have, 15, we have 14 days, counting today, to close. And what happened was, long story short, the 2009 survey that was done of this property when they bought the last piece of property and then joined it together as one plot, there were things that were not done accurately. Not anything to do with anybody at the church, but on the other end, things were not done accurately, causing us to hit a speed bump. The good news is that someone has stepped forward to resurvey our property, get us the information and paperwork that we need, and is doing it for our church completely at no cost. Thousands of dollars is being donated of work, and they've already surveyed the property. They're coming back Monday to finish up the survey, and there is that possibility that it will all be submitted Monday afternoon, and we'll be back on the fast lane to getting this closing. Isn't, that, isn't God good? He really is. Because if we, if, if we hadn't caught this issue, then when we were ready to sell the property, we would have had an issue. And so we're getting this resolved now. So I just want to keep you updated because I know last Sunday we thought we might be closing. But please just continue to pray. God is moving and at work. Please look at your bulletin. Keep abreast of all of the things that are happening. We've got a lot of great things happening in the next few weeks. Please keep up on all that. We're ready to worship. Pastor Dave, come and let's get started this morning. Good morning on this Pentecost Sunday. Would you stand with me? If you'd like to grab a hymnal as well, you can. 
If those are too heavy for you, the words will be on the screen as well on this hymnal Sunday. Thank you for pointing that out, Charlotte. The words of Jesus from John 14. <clears throat> he says to the disciples, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And all God's people said, what Jesus predicted in John 14 is living reality for us today. And because of that, we can join together as one by the Spirit and sing praises to the one who's called us out of darkness to light. His name is worthy today. Let's sing. We're going to start with uh, number three today. Come thou almighty King. Oh! 
God's people said. Amen. Amen. I invite you to turn back to number 61 as we continue singing this morning. singing remain standing for prayer this morning hallelujah oh bless the lord oh my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name my heart my heart is rejoicing this morning in the mercy and the grace and the love of our god who sent his son into this world that while we were yet sinners he died for us that he who was rich for our sakes became poor, that through his poverty we might be made rich this morning. You might not have two Lincolns to rub together in your pocket, but I'm telling you, if you have Jesus Christ this morning, if you are in Christ, you are rich beyond your wildest imagination today. All oh, the riches, the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ are ours today. Blessed be his name. We look to the Lord in prayer today, and as we do, we certainly want to take time to lift our voices in praise to our God. 
We give him praise that Sister Keaton is doing well. I just talked to Vicki back there just a few moments ago in Brooklyn and got an update. Yesterday she was setting up. She's cognitive. They've been able to remove some of the tubes and she's doing as well as could be expected. Maybe even a little better. We just want to continue to remember Sister Keaton in our prayers who is connected and related to so many people here. I also want us to remember Cindy, Cindy Robinson, who is trying to recover from surgery, and Cindy really does need our prayers. We want to continue to pray for her. Got to visit with Marilyn Muir last week, who's battling cancer. Continue to remember Marilyn in your prayers. She's doing well. Daryl, it's good to see you here today in the service, and we want you to know we love you and Marilyn. We're praying for you regularly. And then I have a dear friend down in Florida, a pastor by the name of Rick Addison, who has been placed on hospice care and with the serious heart issues and other issues. I wish you would remember my friend Rick Addison in your prayers today, that God's will would be done and that God would be with him and his wife Karen there in Stewart, Florida. God would just be with them today in a special way. So good to have my good friend here today, Brother James Sutherland. Reverend Sutherland, I want you to come. Lead us in prayer today. I've known him for I've known him for more than half my life. I remember him when he was younger than me. And I thought he was old then, but he wasn't. We're so glad to have you today and your wife. God bless you, Brother Sutherland. We love you. Lead us in prayer today, if you would. Shall we look to the Lord in prayer? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much this morning that we have the privilege of laying aside all the burdens and even things to rejoice in throughout this week and to come and worship the King of kings and Lord of lords. We thank you, O oh God, for the price that you paid on the cross. We thank you for the love of God that kept you there until you cried, It is finished, and the plan of salvation long before we were ever born was already made that we might be able to look to Jesus Christ for the saving of our souls and the redemption of our, our sins and our sinfulness. We thank you, Lord, for people of like mind that have gathered together today to worship and praise thee. Thank you for the wonderful songs that we have sung, Lord. And we do adore thee and worship thee. Just help us to be, Lord, better examples of that love that's been demonstrated to us so unworthily. And then, our Father, we come to that point where we ask special help for individuals whose names have been mentioned. I think about Sister Keaton, Lord, and the surprise we received when we realized what condition that she was in and the surgery she was facing. But it's so wonderful to hear the good report. And I pray that you would continue the healing processes there. Remember Cindy, whose name has been mentioned here this morning also. And then Rick Addison, Lord, we pray that thou would put your hand upon him. And then, our Father, we ask you especially for uh, our pastoral team and the ministerial team here uh, that, uh, that they're not, not only would we be lost in the love of Jesus Christ, but help us in the sharing of his blessed name and the plan of salvation to many others. And then I think about, Lord, the legal uh, situations and things that that have to be taken care of as the transition is made across town. We just ask you to step in and supply every need and take care of every detail and do it speedily, Lord. And then as the church makes that transition, may a, a new light shine in an eastern neighborhood that will glorify God and reach out to new people. May there be spiritual growth and numerical growth. And may the power and blessings of God rest upon this church and its ministry, Father. Touch uh, Pastor Cravens, Lord, and encourage his heart and his wife and family. And bless the team, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you for coming here and not disappointing us because we found you when we walked in the door. We love you this morning. Worship thee, and we ask for thy blessing upon your people today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 In the name of the Lord, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. I'm going to ask the ushers to get ready to receive the offering and also if they would to grab those pledge cards just for a moment. We're going to take just a moment to hand those out very quickly. I don't want to take a lot of time. Children can be dismissed to go to junior church at this time. So if any of the children would like to go on ahead and make their way back, we've got Carrie, I think, is back there ready to help you out 
Westwood Junior Church. We have a good report today, and that, that is we are at right close to 134, 133.5. So every week we're going up a few thousand. We are right now within about 66,000 of our goal. So if nothing else, take it for a prayer card, but we're just going to take just a moment. We'd like to, if you haven't given, yeah, I'll give one to my wife. She might, you never know, the Lord might touch her, she might give some more money. <laughs> She's prone to do things like that. I don't know how many times we have double pledged in, in situations, and it was interesting how close we were to the same amount so many times. But we need, we'd like to receive another 66,000 if at all possible. And here is why. Because if we could get the full 200,000 we're trying to raise with the sale of the property, which please be praying much for that this Friday, I meet with the lady who owns the business next door. And they're offering us $700,000 for this property, which is incredible. Uh, we would, so we could be very close if we could get all the 200,000 in by the 1st of September to having on our September 18th dedication Sunday we could very well be having a mortgage burning on that same Sunday that's a very real possibility if we could get the next sixty-six thousand dollars now I know some of you've got rich aunts and rich uncles and rich grandpas and rich whatever you know what? It's amazing. It is amazing to me, isn't David, how many non-attenders of this church have literally thousands of dollars have come in. Just this week, I had breakfast with a man, slipped me a check for $200, said, put this in your building fund. Uh, a, a, a realtor in, on Beachmont Avenue who's never darkened doors of our church gave us $500 just because we were moving in the area. And the list could go on and on and on of people who God is touching their hearts and are not even part of our congregation. I just want to encourage you, share it with all your friends and neighbors. Let them know if they're looking for a place to stay. There are people, literally, believe it or not, that need to give money away. I've never been one of those, but there are those kind of people out there. Be praying much that God would do, his will would be done, and if we could raise this money, wouldn't that be wonderful if we could burn the mortgage on the day of our dedication? Amen? That would be so wonderful. Ushers come at this time. We're going to receive our offerings. If you would like to give to the building fund, you can mark it on an envelope. Go to the website at the drop down. Go to the building fund, and there you can place your offering. Jason Hopkins, would you ask God's blessing, please, on the offering? Thank you for the opportunity we have to give to you. Please bless our offering. Help us in the rest of the service. Amen. Yeah.
think we ought to sing that? How many of you think we ought to sing that chorus? Man, that's a goldie oldie. I can remember singing that way back in the day. Let's try it together. All right, here we go. God and may it be so. Praise the Lord. Amen. Isn't that orchestra great? Amen. Bless the orchestra. Amen. All right. We're ready to go, right? All right. This We're going to have communion here today and so uh, we are excited about being able to end our service today celebrating together the Lord's Supper. What a wonderful Sunday to be celebrating. Almost feels like camp meeting today, doesn't it? In fact, we could turn the AC off if you wanted us to, but we don't have those funeral home fans. That's the only problem, you know, with the stick. We, yeah. How many remember the funeral home fans at camp meeting? Why in the world we got them from funeral homes? I don't know. You know, it's who knows. There may be a connection there, but we don't want to go there today. Ephesians chapter three. Ephesians chapter three today. As we continue and through the book of Ephesians, as we have been studying on the subject of our identity and our inheritance in Christ. Your identity and your inheritance in Christ. It is important that we as Christians know who we are in Jesus Christ and the richness of our inheritance in Jesus Christ. Lest, as I've mentioned already a couple times, like the word of the song, the devil makes us think we are paupers when we're children of the king. I want you to more than ever through this series to realize how rich you are in Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's stand as we honor the reading of God's word on this Sunday morning, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation, the stewardship of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit. His holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body. Very important to understand that. Fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. According to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Oh. 
Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. The word of God for the people of God. God. Shake hands with somebody and say, I'm glad to be in church. How about you? And then you may be seated. I'd like to share for a little while this morning as we prepare our hearts for this wonderful time of communion, the mystery, the mystery of Christ revealed. The mystery of Christ revealed. Of all the genres of reading, my favorite is mystery. Anybody here besides me like to read the whodunit kind of books? I like to read the kind that don't let you know who did it, but share with you all of the clues, and you're trying to guess along with it. Anybody like that besides me? I like to know. I don't like to come to the end and suddenly they pull out some surprise. There was something that detective knew that I didn't know all along the way. That's not fair. It's just not fair, you know, because I want to be able to do my own detective work as I read the book. There's something about mystery that is intriguing to me. He says here that this mystery that was once unknown but is now made known is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now that just might go over our heads this morning, but you have to understand in the first century, in early Christendom, as the gospel message went out from Pentecost onward, this was a startling, life-changing revelation that was hidden to the prophets of old, even though there are glimpses and times when we see that the Gentiles are in some way going to receive the benefits of salvation. Never in the Jews' mind was it ever thought that there would be a day when the Gentiles would have equal footing with the Jews in the promises and the inheritance of God. God held this back, this mystery. The word mystery appears 21 times in Paul's writings and six times in this letter to the Ephesians. The term, as we read it here, though, does not refer to something that is still not known, but something that is known but has only been known because God revealed it. It wasn't something that anybody figured out on their own. It came, as we see in the context of our reading, it came by revelation of the Holy Spirit. He revealed this. It was a mystery. But then God made it known. More specifically here, it reveres the revelation that the Gentiles are included in Christ Not only that they can be saved from hell, but that they are equal heirs of all the salvation promises of God that are to the Jewish people. That we, that's why when we get to the book of Revelation and we see the great throng around the Lamb of God, they're out of every nation and language and tongue and race, all of them equally part of the great church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because in Christ, by Christ, through Christ, because of Christ, He tore down the middle wall of partition. He took of the two and made one new man, and we who were once without hope in this world and under the wrath of God void of the promises of God have been brought into the family of God not as stepchildren, half children but whole children through Jesus Christ our Lord who redeemed us and saved us that's good news friends that's why it's called the gospel it's the good news that in Christ all are included and are one As we partake of the communion today, I want that to to 
filter through our minds that the communion, and there's a reason we call it the communion, is the fact that when we partake of this, we are not only illustrating our oneness in the body of Christ, but our oneness with the universal church of Jesus Christ in every day and every age and every time, we are all one in Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, hallelujah, friends. That's exciting news. Let's look at this passage today. Number one, as we think about the mystery of Christ revealed, I think it's important for us to take a step back and look at Paul's role in the mystery of Christ. Paul's role in the mystery of Christ. Because intentionally, Paul specifically looks at various roles in which he defines his responsibility and his part in the mystery of Christ. First of all, clearly we see his role as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Look again at verse 1. I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, Christ. Notice he calls him Jesus Christ. Christ meaning, anybody remember? What, what is Christ the equivalent of? The Messiah. Our Messiah. Well, I thought he was the Jews' Messiah. No, he is our Messiah too, ladies and gentlemen. I, the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, for you, the Gentiles. Paul is making it very clear that he's a prisoner of the Lord. He feels by that he means the fact that he is literally under the Lord's sovereign control of his life and the ownership of him, and he goes where he is led and does what he is told. He sees himself not as a slave to Rome, but as a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting how there in Rome, and when you read in the Philippians, how Paul, God used him mightily to where many of Caesar's household eventually became under the influence of the gospel and saved. It really makes you wonder who the real prisoner was in Rome. Who the real captive audience was in Rome. Could you imagine how in the world could you be hooked up beside the Apostle Paul for four hours and not ultimately be converted? You know what I'm saying? We know from Acts 22 that the reason he was thrown in prison was because he went to Jerusalem. And when he was there, he spoke about the call of God upon his life. And how the voice came from heaven that said to him to go and to share the gospel message with the Gentiles. And the moment he said that the Lord had sent him to go to the Gentiles, they broke out and ready to kill him and destroy him setting in motion a series of events that led him to be a prisoner, writing this epistle we're reading today. Secondly, we see within the mystery his role as a steward of God's grace. Look at what he says. Verse 2, the dispensation, the stewardship of the grace of God which was given to me. So I am not only a prisoner of the Lord, but when it comes to this matter of the mystery, God has given me a responsibility, a stewardship. Now, the, if I remember right, the first time a steward appears in the Bible, you go back to the days of Abraham. Remember the days of Abraham? And Abraham is looking for a wife for his son Isaac. Remember that story? And what did he do? He sent his steward to go and to find a wife from him from among his people. Remember that story? How would you have liked for your dad to have sent his, somebody from work that worked for him to go find your spouse for you? Wouldn't that be interesting? Stewards were people that were firmly trusted by the one whom they served. And they did not serve to do their own will, but they served to do the will of the one to whom they were stewarded. It was an awesome responsibility. And so he's saying here, when it comes to the matter of sharing the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm a prisoner of the Lord, but I also have been given a tremendous stewardship, a responsibility to share this grace. It's interesting that this, this stewardship carries with it four ideas. Ownership, that you're not the owner, only the steward. Responsibility accountability, and ultimately reward. Paul said, I am a steward of the grace of God. Thirdly, his role as a minister. He says later on, he says in verse 7, of this gospel, I was made a minister, a servant, according to the gift of God's grace. 
This word that is used here for minister is the word from which we get our word deacon. Because in the early church, the deacons were people who were there to serve the local body, the local church. And so Paul says, I'm a prisoner. I'm also a steward. I'm also a minister according to the gift of God's grace. And lastly, he said, I am a preacher. Look at verse 8. To me, I'm less than the least of all saints. This grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. Now, I know this is making our eyes kind of glaze over for just a moment. But bear with me because I think this is very important. Because it underlines the significant role that all those who belong to Christ have to share the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to all men. To see ourselves as servants, to see ourselves as being ministers, deacons, to see ourselves as being preachers, proclaimers, witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I also notice, as you look at this in the context, what he says, this continual link with the grace of God. Notice that. I've drawn lines in my Bibles and circles in my Bible. You might not think that's very spiritual, but I'll tell you what, it helps a guy like me. And as I went through and I circled the word grace, and then I circled where it says the grace was given, the gift of grace least of all the apostles, this grace was given, it suddenly came to my realization that this role that Paul played was not a role that he did in his own strength or his own power, but it was the grace of God that enabled him to do it. You see, friend, grace is a gift of God. You can't earn it, and you can't merit it. It's a gift from God. But here's the flip side of the coin, and that is this, that with the grace of God comes tremendous responsibility. The grace of God that was given, remember what he said in 1 Corinthians 15, for I am what I am by the grace of God, but that grace was not in vain. Why? And I labored more abundantly than them all, but not I, but it was the grace of God within me. What's he trying to say here? The saying is that God's gift to you of his grace is not for you to just sit on a pew and whistle merry tunes and glide on into heaven. God gives us grace to empower and equip us to perform the work of the gospel ministry in the world in which we live. You've been given grace, a gift that you didn't merit or earn, but it was given to you to do something with, to empower you, to equip you to share the good news of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Isn't that exciting? It's not me, but it's the grace of God within me, empowering me. But secondly, for a moment, let's look at the Holy Spirit's role in the mystery of Christ on this Pentecost Sunday. This to me is, uh, again, you know it's amazing how often you could read something and never see, see what needs to be set, seen there? It, was, it just suddenly leaped out to me as I looked at this. Look back at verse 3. How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which you, when you read, you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. It was either a former letter or is referring to maybe Romans or Colossians that was circulated. We don't know. Which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed by who? By the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. That the Gentiles should be heirs of the same body and partakers of of his promise. How was it made known? How was the mystery of Christ revealed? It was revealed through the Holy Spirit. Now, you can challenge me and I'm and I'm I, I'm not I'm saying is if I can be tutored in this, please tutor this me in this. But not everything that Christ's followers needed to know was known by the time of the ascension. It's true. For Jesus said, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will lead you 
into all truth. Great message. Didn't Pastor Dave do a great job last Sunday? That was a great message last Sunday. And I believe in that message that he even mentioned, just kind of briefly talked about Peter and Cornelius. Isn't it amazing how God had to change Peter's mind even after Pentecost to get him to come to understand a truth he did not even understand at the ascension of Jesus, and that is this, that God is no respecter of persons. How was that revealed to him? It was revealed by the Holy Spirit. That's how it was revealed to him. And so it is that the Holy Spirit revealed to his men and women the fact that the Gentiles are equal with the Jews in salvation. Look at Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. Do you not see this equ the equality between Jews and Gentiles? happening whenever they say these men are drunk with wine when they're speaking in these different languages he looks at the crowd and says Peter does and it shall come to pass in the last day says God I will pour out my spirit upon what's the next word all flesh all flesh your sons your daughters shall prophesy your young men shall dream visions your old men shall dream dreams on the handmaid, on the servant, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I'll show signs and wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth below and blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass, do not miss this, that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, Pentecost was also a sign of the universal salvation through Jesus Christ. For all flesh, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Then we go to Acts chapter 10. Again, when, when we have that pouring of the Spirit upon the Gentiles... Acts 10, 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished. They were astonished at what? That the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues or languages and praising God. What was the startling revelation to the circumcised Jews? Can you believe this? This outpouring of the Spirit is not just for the Jews, but lo and behold, it's for the Gentiles too. It had been a mystery. But the Spirit is revealing the truth. So much so that in Acts 15, when they were having the Jerusalem Council, Peter makes this statement. He says, So God who knows the heart, Acknowledge them, the Gentiles, by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And made no distinction between them, purifying their hearts by faith. <laughs> no distinction. No difference. No, you get, you, you get, you know, you get the five-star plan, you guys get the three-star plan. No, no, no. All of us, one new man in Christ has been made. Both Jews and Gentiles are now one in Christ. This was a mystery. And as Christianity began to spread, it suddenly began to dawn upon people as the Holy Spirit begins to make it revealed and known that the Spirit is going to be poured out upon the Gentiles just like it was promised for the Jews. And that promise is ours today, ladies and gentlemen. Church, I want to tell you something. We're not just reading ancient history. When he said he would pour his spirit out upon all flesh, I'm here to tell you that the spirit is available to be poured out upon every one of us today. We can be filled with the spirit. We can be cleansed to the very nature and core of our lives. God can do a radical, thorough work in our lives through the Holy Spirit. And the promise is to us and to our children, it is to the handmaid and to the servants, it is to oh so ever will can come and take of all that God has provided in us, for us in Christ. Well, praise the Lord. Number three, the church's role in the mystery of Christ. Now, I'm just getting ready to tell you 
that I, for a, as little a, a mind as I have, I'm getting out in some very deep waters here. And I don't have all of this figured out yet. But there's a role we play in revealing the mystery of Jesus Christ. Notice this. While the Spirit revealed the mystery of Christ to the apostles and prophets, and while Paul proclaimed the mystery of Christ to the Gentiles, the church proclaims the mystery of Christ to those who are in the heavenly places. Go back again and look at verse 10. Chapter 3, verse 10. To the intent that now the manifold, multifaceted wisdom of God might be made known by the church to principalities and powers in the heavenly places. According... <laughs> To the eternal purpose. In other words, God didn't down the road say, you know what, maybe I ought to put the Gentiles in too. No, 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 no. According to the eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is staggering to me, friends. F.F. Bruce, in his commentary, believes that the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places, and again, this, is, this phrase happens all throughout the book. It is that spiritual realm in which spiritual forces and angels and demons all dwell in this spiritual realm known as the heavenly places. In fact, this very moment, we are seated, not here at Kenwood, we are seated with Him in the heavenly places. Literally, we are. I, I don't understand it all. There's still a sense of mystery I'm still trying to piece together. But the reality is that we, the church, as part of God's redemptive scheme and plan to include all people, was not even known to the heavenly realm. They didn't even know this. They didn't even realize that God was... You know, isn't God amazing? Isn't, I'm serious. Isn't He amazing? He didn't even tell the angels of heaven all about this. And the heavenly realm is watching in amazement as the wisdom of God in its manifold, multifaceted dimensions. The God who is wiser and His wisdom surpasses all wisdoms accumulated together. God in His wisdom predetermined that you and I would be equal shares in the inheritance in Christ. And all of heaven said, Wow. I didn't see this one coming. I didn't see this happening. Look at this. God took a people that were not a people. And made them His people. God took a people that didn't have any hope. And he gave them hope. God took a people that were without promise. And look, he gave them promise. That through the first Adam, all fell. But through the second Adam, all mankind is being redeemed. Paradise was lost, but lo and behold, paradise is being restored. And those in the heavenly realm, we, the church, bear witness to the manifold wisdom of God as they look upon the church. I'm telling you, friends, that is amazing. You remember what Peter said in 1 Peter 1, chapter 10? Let me get this page turned. I'll read it for you. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with greatest care trying to find out the time and the circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when He predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have not been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. 
For whatever reason, God did not develop a plan of salvation for fallen angels. But angels look on in amazement at salvation and redemption. That God would save a race that turned its back on Him. And that God would send His Son to die, not only for the Jews, but for all people. And angels look in wonder upon this marvelous plan of redemption. Do you, do you know who you are today? Do you recognize your identity and your inheritance today? That we are part of the church of Jesus Christ who bears witnesses to the mystery of Christ. Through the church, that which was hidden has been made known. And through the church, the wisdom of God has been made manifest. Before we sing a song and transition into our time of communion, I'm going to leave you with four applications to think about as we close. Number one, I think we need to seriously need to stop and intentionally rejoice in what Christ has accomplished for us. <laughs> Secondly, we need to recognize who we truly are in Christ. Fully recognizing who we are. Thirdly, we need to remember that in Christ Jesus our Lord, we have boldness and access with confidence through faith. And fourthly, as we come to the Lord's table, to recommit ourselves to the great work of God's grace, both in us and through us, and reaching out to a world that needs to know there's hope in Jesus Christ. Amen? Pastor Dave, come, and we're going to sing a song at this time, and we're going to transition into communion. If you, by chance, did not get a communion cup, they're back in the back. Feel free to stop back and get you one. God bless you. Let's sing together. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, As we come to the table today, Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the blood, of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Communion here at Kenwood Bible Methodist is open to all believers. You do not have to be a member of this church or a regular attendee of this congregation to join with us. For as our invitation states, all you who do truly and earnestly repent of your sins, who live in love and peace with your neighbors, and who intend to lead a new life following the commands of God, and walking in His holy ways, draw near with faith 
and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and make your humble confession to Almighty God. Would you bow your heads with me and let's observe a few moments of silent prayer, allowing you a moment to speak to your Heavenly Father as you prepare your hearts for this communion. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for all your mighty acts, but especially for giving your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, whereby he offered up himself as a full and perfect sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. So, Father, humbly we come now to this holy sacrament which our Lord has instituted and commanded us to keep as a continual remembrance of his atoning death and sacrifice until he comes again. Oh, may this time together be a time of drawing near to you by faith. Yes. And we might receive your grace and renew our commitment to follow you faithfully and to love you with all our mind, soul, body, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Now I'm asking you to join in with me to pray as our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing of the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Christ, our Passover lamb, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Before we do that today, let us declare the mystery of our faith, which is simply Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Let's join our voices with people around the world today confessing the same thing. And for saints, for thousands of years, the earliest Christians would have confessed this together. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Would you say it with me today? Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. This time, let us take the bread. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you. And feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Let's partake together. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, preserve your body and soul unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Let's now take from the cup together. Would you bow your heads as we pray together today? Lord, just as the outpouring of your Holy Spirit on Pentecost so drastically changed the lives of the disciples, may the burning fire of your Holy Spirit refine and renew us so that we will never be the same. May we move in the power of the Spirit and may our lives 
be infused with your divine, supernatural touch and authority. May the spirit of wisdom and revelation cause us to grow together in our knowledge of you. And all God's people said, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. You are dismissed. Back here. All members need to be back here at five minutes till 11. So please, all members of the church, be back here at five minutes till 11. God bless you.